All right, we left off last week where the writer has been comparing Jesus Christ to Moses. And uh, you know that last song we just uh, sang? For the heart of this people has grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they understand, and their hearts uh, are turned that I should heal them. That is a perfect scripture passage to introduce us to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we ended where we pointed out in the writer's efforts to show Jesus was better than Moses. Not that Moses is bad, but that the Lord Jesus is better. Uh, he says in verse 6 that Moses was faithful to his whole house where he was a servant. Do you remember that concept? He was faithful to a house where he was a servant. And then he continues and goes on, but Jesus, the Son of God, is faithful to the world uh, as a son. So we compared the idea of being a servant to being a son, and that's where we left off last week. We led us into a discussion about being a child of God versus a son or daughter of God. And... Uh, here in chapter 3, we are about to embark on a master's course, I think, discussion on uh, what it means to be a genuine, authentic, sold out, from the heart, daughter, or son of glory, and, and the opposite, what it looks like to be a inauthentic, not sold out, not from the heart, disingenuous believer. We have, we have them both here without the author even really saying it. It's the absence or the presence, it's the strength or the weakness of faith that determines our walk and yes, our present status and even our future status as believers, faith. Now, since last week, I've had a few people come up and with some concerns about my comparison between being a child of God and a son or a daughter of God. Some of them were very mature in their walk. They knew the Bible well, and others were relatively new believers. So it's important to pause for just a second and reiterate the importance of what we're talking about. Last week, I said that when we walk by the Spirit, when we are willing to be disciplined by God, and when we are willing to subject ourselves or be subjected to suffering, those were three key biblical elements by which we would grow as sons and daughters of God. And, and I mentioned those. In the end, it is all, and I mean all, about maintaining and growing in faith, which then translates into our loving and I know I've, if you've been here long enough, you know this is, the, this is the note I play all the time on the piano. It has to be this face. I don't, I, don't, I don't think Christians are going to be judged by anything at all but the love that we exhibited or didn't exhibit in our lives. The, but the thing about it is, is this love can only be present in the same proportion as the amount of faith that we have. You're not going to be able to love more and have it practically applied than the amount of faith that you have uh, amassed in your life. So faith always comes first, and as that's established, your love and ability to love will begin, you, begin to grow. So little faith, little capacity to love as a believer, with agape love I'm talking about, and large faith, potential for large love. It's kind of like we have the good news in our hands as believers, and uh, to borrow from a parable of the king, we have soil, and we take that good news, that seed, whatever you want to call it, and we plant it in that soil, and if that's our faith, that's the good news that we embrace, and we plant it in that soil, and if the soil is lacking nutrients, that seed of faith, that good news that we've embraced is going to produce a very weak crop of fruit, of love. If we plant it in soil full of nutrients and rich earth, then that faith will grow into 
large amounts of love. So it is the faith in the soil that helps us to grow. And, and you're not going to have the fruits unless you have the faith. That's kind of a parallel to consider. It takes faith to believe that God has forgiven me of all my sins, past, present, and future. If I believe in that principle, I then can forgive anybody else of all their sins, past, present, and future, and that's loving. You see the connection between believing in what God has told me about himself and about our relationship to it transferring into love for others? It takes faith to believe that God will avenge the wrongs that are heaped upon me. If I believe in that, I will turn the other cheek. That takes faith to have. By turning the other cheek, I exhibit love. So the order is large faith, large love. Little faith, little love. It takes faith to believe God desires that I should serve and help and that he sees all that, that I am doing as a believer in my quiet walk with him. And by believing that and having the faith that he does see and is cognizant of that and that he does require that, I in turn am able to do those things unselfishly and that is love. So if we step back and look at each of those scenarios I just gave you, they all include us being under the, the hothouse lamps of willing to be discipled, willing to submit, suffering, walking by the Spirit. All three of those principles are there as we develop this faith and then it translates into our giving love. Don't ever let me or anyone else lead you to believe that Becoming sons and daughters means doing, 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 and perfecting your flesh. It's impossible. The flesh is rotten to the core. It means dying, 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 and letting God lead us to greater faith on him, less reliance upon our own philosophies and selves, and loving more as a result. There's a huge difference in those scales. And once those are understood, then you'll understand better maybe what we're talking about when it comes to being a child of God versus a son or daughter of God. Faith is at the heart of the passages we're going to read today in Hebrews and uh, chapter 3. And as I said, there's some profound messages that the writer of Hebrews gives to us here. So uh, pray the Holy Spirit is with us at this juncture. Okay, after line, the line Jesus says about being, it says about Jesus being a son in verse 6, it continues... It says, but Jesus as the son was faithful to the whole world. And then it says, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm until the end? It said, Jesus was faithful to his whole house. Whose house are we if, if we hold fast confidence, that's part of faith, and rejoicing of the hope firm until the end, okay? Now, in order to really capture what is being said here, and uh, two difficult things have to occur, and this is gonna be our text for the next few weeks. One, in our study of three, we have to study the whole chapter, really, from this point forward to the end to understand, and then we have to understand every verse to really bring the whole chapter into view, and because of time constraints, and a very awkward parenthetical reference, that the author includes here, it seems awkward, but it's ingenious. It makes the study of this difficult. So if you open your Bibles, op you, you open to verse seven, that's where we are today, and the writer says, wherefore, all right? After that, you'll see uh, parentheses, and the parenthetical reference goes all the way down to the end of verse 11. So let me read how it should read if that awkward parenthetical reference was not in the scripture. It would say, wherefore, verse 7, verse 12, take heed, brethren and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some when they had heard did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? 
Was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom he sware that he should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? And he says, so we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. That's the full chapter without that parenthetical reference. Now back to verse 6. Today our study gets dicey due to that long parenthetical reference that the writer has included in his epistle. But it's easy when you realize that we are just going to re- we're just going to take that reference in and of itself and talk about it. So, the writer of Hebrews has been comparing Jesus to Moses in verses 1 through 6. In verse 7 he says therefore or wherefore and then he puts that long reference in those uh, parentheses. Um, And he continues on at verse 12 with it. So let's take the parenthetical reference now and let's see what the writer has to say. And the whole point of this is, the whole chapter is, don't let your heart get caught up in unbelief. Endure and proceed forward with a heart of faith. Because in the end, the result of unbelief in the example he uses of the children of Israel is they didn't enter into the promised land because of unbelief. So he says, wherefore, verse 7, then to verse 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief. That's his point. So listen, with sin having been wiped away by Jesus, there remains only one sin that is not forgivable in this life nor in the life to come. Unbelief, faithlessness, that sin there is no forgiveness. As a means to provide the Hebrew reader and then us with examples of faithlessness and the end results if it is allowed to stay and harden the heart, The writer appeals to a very familiar story from the Old Testament that any Jew would recognize, the story of Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, and into the wilderness, and how the children of Israel responded to that being led out by Moses. Instead of retelling the entire tale here, what the writer does is he includes a reference from Psalm 95 which summarizes the tale of what happened in the wilderness. So we're reading along in Hebrews. We come, to, we come to, we could be of the household of Christ if we don't lose our confidence. We come to verse 7, wherefore, and then he sticks in this parenthetical reference that tells the story of what the children of Israel did under Moses leading them through the wilderness. And he uses this as an example of how not to lose faith. Okay, hopefully that's clear. And what a meaty, substantive quote it is from uh, Psalms 95, because it talks about how they hardened their heart toward God while they were in the wilderness, instead of looking at the miracles that brought them there, praising God and relying on Him for all the things that uh, they had seen to get them to the point that they were. So again, the writer's point is to warn the reader against hardening our hearts to the point of unbelief, And he quotes Psalms 95 as an example of what not to be like as Christians. This epistle is written to believers. So I'm not going to talk about the wherefore, verse 7, that leads to verse 12, take heed instructions, until next week. Today I'm going to focus on the Psalm 95 reference and, and point out what he is doing by using it. Okay, so here we go. In verse 6 we read, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm until the end. Then he says, Wherefore, and now we get into the reference. The thing we first notice about the reference in Psalm 95 is that the author tells us that the Holy Spirit is the one who dictated it. Okay? Now, he says, As the Holy Ghost said, And he's quoting Psalm 95. He says, as the Holy Ghost said. All right? And then we have the reference. Anyone who doesn't believe that Psalms is an inspired book needs to take a look at this reference where the writer of Hebrews says, the Holy Ghost is the one who uttered this in Psalm. Okay? 
Now, uh, the word that is used there is God-breathed when it comes to receiving inspiration. It's God-breathed. In 2 Timothy 3.16, we read, you're familiar with this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That word in inspiration is a Greek word and it's composed of two parts, theo and uh, nuostos. Theo is, relates to God. Nuostos starts with a P. P-N in the Greek. So it's Theo, God, Neustis. What other words start with P-N? Pneumonia, related to breathing. Pneumatic drills that are run off air. So we have God breathe. That's what pneumosis means. And this is what inspiration means when it writes that in 2 Timothy, that all scripture is uh, given by Theo pneumosis. God breathed, all scripture, and they're particularly talking about the Old Testament there, okay? Um, Second Peter tells us how God did breathe scripture out. You ready? Second Peter 1.21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, meaning the Old Testament wasn't written by a bunch of old Jewish guys who sat around and came up with a myth. Peter says, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we have that theonuosis going on, the Holy Spirit moving holy men who would then write. And so the writer of Hebrews says, the Holy Spirit says in Psalm 95, this stuff that's in the parentheses that we're about to digest. In other words, the breath of God inspires or gives life. And um, when God breathed into Adam, remember the inanimate clay, he breathed into Adam and Adam became a living soul. It was that God-driven spirit into that clay that made him a living mind, will, and emotion of Adam. And that living, that, that spark of life that God breathed into him is a spark of life that ignites all children who have come down from Adam from that point forward. When men and women read God's word, which originated from God breathing on men, holy men back in the day, inspiring them, in, giving them inspiration, we are also made alive and, and, and inspired, hence the Im import of the word of God in our lives is it's the word of God who's going to bring us this new life as we read it and study it. Critics of the Bible say things like the Bible was just written by a bunch of men. And in some ways that's true. Yes, it was written by a bunch of men. But those, they neglect to point out that the, those men had the Holy Spirit um, breathe pneumatically into them. And that is when God uh, spoke. So in any case, the writer of Hebrews tells us that the Holy Spirit was the one who uttered uh, Psalm 95, 7 through 11, uh, and the events to which it refers, all right? So Psalm 95, 7 through 11 talks about how the children of Israel, while in the wilderness, having come out of Egypt, had hardened their hearts against God in a number of different ways, and how God became so grieved over their unbelieving hearts that they weren't allowed, the original children of Israel who came out with Moses were not allowed to enter into the promised land. None of them did, I think, except for Joshua. I could be wrong on that. Who, Caleb? And Caleb or just Joshua? And, because they went into the promised land, came back and gave the good report. So, so grieved they did not, because of their unbelief, enter into the promised land. Again, this picture is being presented as a picture to believers, to holy brethren, as the chapter starts out referring to uh, the intended audience and us. So that's the summary of these passages in Psalm 95. That is what is happening. But what do the verses actually say? The writer of the book of Hebrews wants the readers of the epistle to understand verse 7. Okay, the spirit cautioned and said today, children of Israel, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, God said through the Holy Spirit, 
I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest in parenthetical reference okay so today the writer quotes from Psalms to Christian believers and says today is the time to believe and resist the temptation to harden the heart toward unbelief today right now if you, you I, again, I'm doing a lot of preaching to the choir, but you guys are believers. So hopefully it, it here, not many of you are struggling with belief, but some of you might be. And what he says is quickly, today, as the children of Israel were told, don't let your heart become hardened through unbelief. Don't let that start to work. I would suggest the term has significance because doubt is, is sort of like a mirror to faith in how it takes hold, in my opinion. What I mean by this is faithlessness begins in small ways and snowballs forward until it has consumed a person. It begins small just like faith begins small. Faith starts small and grows. Doubt starts small and grows. And it seems that no matter what you have faith in, this principle holds true, okay? Which is why the cults are constantly monitoring every single thought that people have because they don't want that little bit of doubt to get because it will roll to the point where they say, wait a minute, now the light is on, you see. Oh, so they say, no, 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 don't read anything different. Stay off any internet sites like this. Don't do this because the principle is almost universal. A little doubt will roll forward into big doubt, uh, just like a little faith will, war will roll forward if fed. Um, so if you established your faith in the wisdom of, let's say, seagulls, and you believe seagulls are the, have the solution to life, Jonathan Livingston Seagull I'm specifically referring to, and that has just changed your life, and you're really fully confirmed in your faith about seagulls, but you let yourself to say, you know, they really aren't that smart of a bird, and then you start to let that grow, pretty soon you will see the er errancy of your ways in putting your faith upon a seagull. Because all things will crumble under the light of truth when you really examine it. That's why the cults and other groups are so afraid of you investigating. But with Christ, because he is true and doesn't crack or crumble, you can then allow the Holy Spirit to lead you through those times of doubt. But just don't let it harden your heart is the point. We all have doubts daily sometimes, hour by hour about things. But don't let it harden the heart is the point the writer is supposed to make. So whatever the object of our faith and devotion, uh, or excuse me, whether the object of our faith and devotion is true, as in true in the true and living God, or false, as in David Koresh or, or, or Waco or, or Mormonism, the destruction of such faith is cumulative in every case. And so the directive is act today. Act today on what you're going to do with your faith. Today, he says, if you will hear, verse 8, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. In other words, the writer challenges us and uh, as Christian recipients of this epistle, don't harden your hearts as the children of Israel did when they provoked. That's the day of provocation. When they provoked God to anger uh, in the day when they tempted him when they were in the wilderness. Tempted him to lash out and destroy them. Tempted him to uh, get angry at them. Don't, in the day of provocation, become like they did, he's saying. And he goes on in verse 9, adding or reiterating uh, the event who... Uh, the event he is talking about by quoting God who says, When your fathers, verse 9, tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. What that means is your fathers, they saw the glorious things I did for them for 40 years, and yet they continued to tempt me. They continued to try to prove me, meaning uh, they were saying, prove to us, God. Prove to us, God. And, and the writer is saying, don't go down this road in your heart because it will not end up uh, well, now stay with me. How exactly or in what ways were the children of Israel's faithless hard hearts manifested 
when they were in the wilderness with Moses? What did they do as a collective group that, that kind of all the time kept provoking God to anger and trying to tempt him to wipe them out and to uh, make him so angry with them? This is really important to understand because these are the very same things that we as believers will entertain and do in our walk as Christians toward God when we start ang ambling down a road toward faithlessness. And so he's warning us, listen, in the house of Israel, I mean, when they came out of bondage and they came through the wilderness, this is what they did. Don't do the same thing. Well, what did they do? And we're going to learn right now how they're the very same principles for us as believers. So let's look at the things the children of uh, Israel did that got God's anger up with them and ultimately led to their hearts being so hard with unbelief that they were not allowed to enter into the promised land. Now, one point about this. <coughs> it is thought <coughs> that the picture is they believed on Moses. They came out of bondage. They went through the Red Sea on dry ground. That was their baptism. They had not yet been baptized with the Holy Spirit, which is part and parcel of the Christian walk. And that occurred when they would cross the River Jordan and go into the Promised Land. So they had been physically water baptized, the, the baptism of Moses, Paul calls it, and uh, uh, went through dry ground. So it's like it's a picture for the church, for a believer. You've entered into belief. You followed Moses out of bondage. He said, I can lead you to freedom. Moses being a type of Christ. They were baptized through the Red Sea. They came out and they were supposed to enter the promised land. It was like 13 miles away from where they came out but they didn't for 40 years. They wandered around and around and around and around, never having that Holy Spirit come and fill them be, and crossing the River Jordan, symbolic of that, because of their faithlessness. All right? So, uh, also note that God does not, at least in any instance, except for a few special uh, references, but as a people... God never, while the children of Israel were out there, got mad at specific individual sins. We don't see God say the whole children of Israel, while they're traveling in the wilderness, well, and you know with a million of them traveling around that some were lusting and some were violent and some were selfish and some were doing all these individual sins as a group. You know Moses had to deal with that. But God doesn't speak to that. He talks about being provoked by their unbelief by their constant failure to look to him. All right? So, the first provocation occurs in Exodus 15. The children of Israel had seen a number of miracles by the hand of God. All those that took place in Egypt, they saw, from the firstborn son being killed to the plagues and all that. They'd seen that. They had seen how, what God did with Pharaoh, how he wiped them out. They had seen that he put a pillar of fire between them and the pursuing armies to give them time to cross the Red Sea. They saw Moses split the Red Sea. They crossed it on dry ground, it says, so their animals and wheels could get through. Dry ground, sea parted, baptized by the mist of the Red Sea, it says in, in, in uh, the New Testament. And uh, then they saw the, the Egyptians, the pursuers, destroyed. Okay, all of those miracles they uh, saw and their faith was supposedly increased or established. And they look back on the wonderful things God has done for them thus far. And um, what does it do for them? It uh, doesn't do anything for them. Uh, all they do is begin to complain and worry and uh, struggle. They had seen the miracles and... Uh, so we, too, can look back over our lives. We can see the wonderful things God has done for us, leading us out of whatever we were in, sin, religion, whatever it was, delivering us from captivity. We have followed our Lord out, and in work, He's working in and through our lives. He's protecting us. He shields us. We have hidden blessings. If you really sit down and think about them, they'll blow your mind. And all of this picturing what God does in the lives of believers. But once the children of Israel are in the wilderness, they begin to doubt and lose faith. And their doubt is manifested first in complaining. Uh, they complain about... Complaints are the product of worry, when you think about it. 
They're the products of fear, of our own discomfort, of our wanting things to be in the order we want them to be. They're truly based in the nascent life of faithlessness. To complain when you are in God's hands is, is it's like faithlessness trying to rise up and get some roots somewhere, in my opinion. Additionally, complaints are merely manifestations of what's in our heart. When we, hear, when we start to complain about our Christian walk, about our Christian life, about our, what's going on with us and God, it really is our heart speaking what is inside of us, which is the important place. What did Jesus say to the uh, Pharisees, remember? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we have the heart speaking there with the children of Israel. They had seen the, they had seen the miracles, but the complaining was evidence they had no faith in God. I love this passage. We hear it all the time. It is one we ought to take to heart. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. I don't think there's a better single passage that better describes the ultimate mindset that we can have as believers um, that we can't embrace. That passage alone is supreme in terms of how we are to walk our Christian life. Take a minute and collectively, individually, repent. That just means change your mind. Don't go to the old way. Repent of the times where you are not trusting in the Lord with your whole heart and where you have leaned to your own understanding and in all your ways have not acknowledged him and allowed him to direct your paths. If you do that, that heart which David had, Abraham had, that heart is the heart God seeks. Someone who will trust him in thick and thin, who looks to him through doubt, who looks to him through sickness, who looks to him through poverty and job loss and, and all the things that are going to come across our lives at some point or another. Most of us will face cancer at some point in time. Most of us will face problems with money. Most of us will have members of our family who we love who don't know the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not to your own understanding. That is a key to the Christian walk. And uh, write it on your heart now. And if it's fallen from you, repent. Change your mind about that perspective because it is the Christian perspective. Now, the first complaint the children of Israel had was they arrived at a place called Mara, and there the water was not potable. It was uh, very bitter. And it was a challenge. It was a trial of their faith. What actually rose up in their hearts to overwhelm the faith that they did have? Fear, anger, disappointment, unfulfilled expectations, not coming to a beautiful uh, desert pl uh, place, you know, Shangri-La, where they could have all the, uh, they want, that was waiting just 13 miles away. But no, they, right then they had a little trial and the water wasn't there and they began to complain. How did they uh, respond to the trial? Exodus 15 says, they looked to the heavens, they sat down together and said, oh Lord God, we trust you, we will wait on you and your care for us. No, no, that's nowhere there. You know, imagine if the children of Israel, when they found that there was no water there that was potable, they said, let's sit. And they sat in the dust and they raised their hands to God and they said, we trust you, God. He, we he would have sent a, 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 a tornado of milk or something. I mean, he would have done something insane. He wanted their faith. He wanted them to trust in him. He had shown them, I can do this for you. But they automatically, they go to, oh, no, no. What are we going to drink? What are we going to do? Faithlessness. They would have been better to look above and say, I trust. But that's not what children do. Children whine and throw tantrums. And they fear and they doubt all things. So it is we're lacking maybe some of the living water to kind of make a point. We're lacking some kind of nourishment. We thirst for something in our life. We don't believe God is providing it or will provide it, and we begin to complain. So there's the point. The next act of faithlessness the children of Israel took that provoked and tempted the Lord occurred in a land that was actually named sin. 
the land of sin, S-I-N is what it was called. And it appears they suffer now this time from lack of food. Again, there was a want and a desire. Thirst far worse than food, but now food. How did they respond the same way? They went to Moses, they complained, they complained. You know what Moses told them? This is the first time Moses says this. He says, your murmurings are not against me, but they're against God. Think about that principle. What a concept. You really think about it. Any complaint we pose about another man or woman or situation, unless it's like, you know, hey, I bought this blender and it doesn't work, you know, uh, can I get a refund? But I'm talking about complaints against the situation of life. Those complaints are not against the people. Those complaints are against God. And that's what, that's what Moses says. You're not complaining against me that you don't have enough food right now. You're complaining to God. Do you understand that? You, you people of no faith? He's the source. They had seen him save them with fire and separate seas. But they insisted in not walking and waiting in faith. But to question the Lord, to doubt whether he would supply for their demands or not. You're not complaining against me. God will feed you. And guess what? God feeds them. He's a good God. He's a merciful God. And amidst their complaining, he sends them manna from heaven. Another radical miracle. And it softened their hearts completely. No, it didn't. It didn't do much. The manna that I have received in my life from heaven, I praise God, I've had healthy girls. <clears throat> we, have just, we haven't had insurance for, I don't know, 15 years. Healthy girls. God does it. Not me. Not us. He sustains. I'm not saying it's, it's the wisest thing for everybody to do that, but that was our situation. That's what we've done, and he has sustained. He will sustain. If you look to him and say, I'll wait, I'll trust, you will do it. No, they went from one faithful worry to a, the next. There's a principle here. Faith is increased and strengthened when it's tried and tested. God gave them the test of the water. He gave them the trial of the lacking in food, and they failed every time. Had they sat in the dust, looked to heaven and said, I trust you, God would have provided, their faith would have been strengthened, and the next time they would have been able to overcome again. But if you always fail, 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 you never grow in faith and you remain a child. So you're, you're a child who's just constantly when times get tough, no, no, no. And so God, he's a loving God, he helps, he helps, but you remain a child. He wants the sons and daughters. And so he puts these tests for us. And when we face them, trust in him, he comes through. That faith goes up. Little bit, lot, whatever it is. And you grow. Now, I wish I could say those trials then cease. They get more difficult. Why? Because when you overcome the bigger ones and he sees it through, your faith grows bigger and then you have you have such tremendous faith that the little ones you're worried about then are gone. They're just gone. And that's how sons and daughters walk. The children of Israel rarely as a whole saw their issues through. They very rarely, they always resorted to doubtful responses. God blessed them anyway, but it never grew their faith. They never ever progressed out of more. These children who came out of Egypt they never grew in their faith, and they remained in that wilderness until they all died. In Rephidim, they found themselves thirsty again. Every time they were thirsty or lacking water, God provided. Did they remember this? Never. They complained and complained in faithlessness. They actually said in Rephidim to Moses, You have taken us out from our home and comfort in Egypt only to die of thirst out here. That's what they said. You have removed us from the place that was so wonderful when we were in bondage and we had to work 20 hours a day and we were under the whip. We removed us from that wonderful place in order to come out here and die of thirst. Unbelievable the response. God told Moses, go to a rock, smite that rock one time, a picture of Christ who was smitten for us and living water proceeds forth. And the children of Israel are fed with the living water. Didn't grow in faith. They were just fed physically by the living water. Moses called that place Massa. Due to the chiding the children of Israel did there, they were so faithless, they literally said, 
is the Lord among us or not? <laughs> like a teenager. Yeah. With us or not, Lord? I mean, that's their attitude. And Moses, hearing it, said this place is called Massa. And what it means is terrible teenager throwing a tantrum. I don't know what Massa means. It doesn't mean something good, though. Because they were like, is the Lord with us or not? Oh, faithlessness, hearts of unbelief, doubt manifested in complaints, worry that provoked God to anger. As a believer, have you ever asked, is the Lord with me or not? You know, kind of impetuously. Uh, think about it for a minute. I think anytime we wonder if the Lord is with us, and I've done it many, many times, I've wondered, are you even here? Shamedly, I've wondered, are you even here? We're standing in the midst of a trial of faith. We are, that's all we are standing in the midst of. Of course he's there. And so when we ask that question, it's showing, remember, if you get to the point where you're saying, Lord, are you even here? That's a trial that you're in. That is something that if you overcome it, the faith will grow. That is not that he's not there. He's always there, right? Our true and living God is fully aware of the trials he allows his children to go through according to his wisdom. Do you trust it? Do you believe his will? It is by and through these trials we grow and are able in the future to face and walk deeper waters and to produce fruits of love. You go through these trials and you come out of them, someone else is totally overwrought with worry about how to pay their electric bill. You've been there 50 times. You sit down with them and now you have grown in faith and now in an exercise of love, faith leads to love, you say, let me encourage you here. Trust God. Trust me. Yes, you're going to do your job. Yes, but you trust in the Lord. He will see you through. You take time. It's a loving act to spend with somebody because you've been there. That's how faith leads to the increased yield of love. The next great act of provocation came when Moses went up to Sinai to receive the law. Moses was their great leader. The children of Israel were left alone without a daddy for a while. And they got quite anxious. And in short order, they worried so much about the absence of Moses and that they might have to fend for themselves out there. They demanded Aaron to go and make them a little golden calf. Mold us a golden calf. Uh, the golden ox came from Egypt. They worshiped them. This was give us a little idol that we can look to. He can be our leader. He can be someone we pray to and put our faith and trust and pour our frustrations out on this idol that we have made for ourselves. So Aaron, he goes and he creates the calf. And, and, and maybe for some it represented the God who had led them out. That that little golden calf was the God who can part the Red Sea. I don't know. But they had him make some idol. And on this idol they focused their attention. And uh, idols that the children of God had not completely left behind. They had an, th this idol that was still in the recesses of their minds. I have a few from my vestiges from my prior life, not with the Lord. Sometimes, like Mary's been gone for uh, three weeks now. She's got, I think, two left. My idols start to crep back up. Man, that, that movie looks radical. I think I'll see that. I've been in a tattoo parlor. 51 years, I've never gotten a tattoo. I've been in a tattoo parlor thinking of getting one. It's just me going back to the old ways I used to be. Do something to keep myself alive. Feeling alive, baby, you know? So go back to those old idols. Go to something that gives us some immediate comfort because that's going to get us through. That's what the children of Israel were doing. And they kept something alive in their heart and when they were tested with not having their papa figure there, Moses, they said, bring us back to where we were. Give us something like that. My daughter, really quickly, true story, she went, she surfs, she's a, a freshman, and she was surfing with her friends at a place called San Onofre. And when they were done surfing, uh, they had camped all night with all the friends. <clears throat> and they decided they were going to take all their goods and put it in this truck, a brand new truck this kid had who lives in a place called Irvine. So he said, load it all up. So they put their tents in, they put everything, and they put the surfboards in, and they loaded it up, and the other kids were going to go get breakfast or something, and this kid was going to take it all back to a central place, and they could come and pick it up at the central place. Well, they got a call about uh, uh, an hour later, and he said, everything's gone. I said, what do you mean? Everything is gone. 
gone. The truck's gone. The, every, the surfboards are gone. The tents are gone. Everything's gone. Why? What happened? Text him a picture. He's on the long side of the freeway. I-5. Truck is ablaze. Fully ablaze. He's standing there just... So they get in the car. They go up. They pull up. And here's the car completely gone, engulfed. They think about 35 grand worth of material. It was a new truck. What happened? Well, the highway patrol comes. What did you have? And then it came out that somebody thought that a couple of the logs that were in the fire that hadn't burned, it would be good to save them too. So they stuck them in there. They weren't, I mean, they picked them up with their hands, stuck them in the, stuck them in the back of the truck, not on fire. Drive off, the guy looks in the back and his truck, the, it, the oxygen fed those suckers and it just lit the whole thing up. True story. And so here's the picture. We have the logs in life and we have, we have the golden calf and the children of Israel did nothing different. They said, let's recreate what has given us comfort before. You know, my, I don't know what your comfort sin is uh, or comfort practice is. We all have them, whatever they are. You're not going to be condemned and lose your relationship from that. You're going to lose your, you're not going to lose your relationship, but you're going to weaken your faith by turning to those things instead of strengthening the things that you have now. And in patience, waiting for Moses to come down from the mount and waiting for God to come back and answer your questions and lead you along like, the, he, did, like he did with the children of Israel because Moses ultimately came down. So what do you do when you're stressful? What do you go back to? It doesn't matter what it is. I, you know, you know, are you turning to him? That's the question, and that's the point. In another incidence of faithlessness and in another instance of longing for elements of their former lives, even when they were in bondage, the Lord had provided them with manna. Remember, he gave it to them because they wanted food, and he had been providing this for them. But you know what? They wanted a little more luxury. They wanted something a little more diverse. They didn't want Taco Bell every day. They wanted McDonald's. So it says in Numbers 11, 4 through 6, And the mixed multitude was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish. And we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. We enter into life with the Lord and all the superfluous luxuries sometimes begin to abate. We have some things. The Lord doesn't mind us to have nice couch, nice life that way. But is it that what you need to have in your life as a Christian? Here, the children of Israel, they had been used to being in bondage, being in slavery, but boy, that food was damn good. <laughs> and they are hearkening back to we are so tired of this manna, can't we get something that will give us a li little flesh? Of course, we know the, what the Lord did. He sent them the quail. Pictures, folks. When times get lean, we not only wonder who will feed us, but we relish the times when times were full and fat. And I don't just mean physically in food. I mean whatever it is. We want the socials or the money or concerts. Uh, we want to go back, you know. Do you believe that your walk with Christ has added true dimension to your life or you have lost true dimension? It's again, it's a matter of your faith and trust and love. God knows the heart. He knows where your treasures lie. He knows what you'll go back to, where your heart is. I have literally, in the course of doing ministry, I've had people literally say to me, I should have stayed LDS. It was far better. Yeah, go back. You know, you, it's no problem. Go on back. See what it's like to be involved in that bondage where while the casseroles might be better and the <laughs> functions might be better and the organization of the Egyptians is far superior than what you're experiencing, you don't have the freedom. So the final test, they get to the land of milk and honey. They send in two spies. The spies come back with, they send in more than two. The spies come back with reports. Some say they carry back big, big 
fruits on poles and it's a wonderful report and some say some other things. Giants in the land. It's a scary place to enter. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword? And that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? They said one to another, let us make, remember they said let us make an idol, the golden calf? Now they say let us make a captain, a man, and let us return to Egypt. So a constant looking back, no man who puts his hand to the plow and, and, and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God, Jesus teaches. And we have the children of Israel in faithlessness doing that time and time again. The trial, the response. The trial, the response. Trial, response. Every single time it ends up in something uh, negative like this. So that is the parenthetical reference that the writer of Hebrews is using to warn the believers there in Hebrews chapter 3. He said, Christ was a son who was faithful to his whole house. Verse 7, wherefore, all the examples from the parenthetical reference. Verse 12, take heed, brethren. Take heed, sisters. This is the instruction for us. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Simple as that. In departing from the living God. But... Exhort one another daily while it is called today. He's repeating what it was said in, in, in Psalm 95. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, again he quotes Psalms 95. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved 40 years is the question. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see, the writer ends with, that they could not enter in because of unbelief. It's the core. We're going to cover those verses 12 through 19 next week in our study of Hebrews chapter 3. Questions? Comments? Yes, sir. This is an amazing uh, point, and it's not taught anymore very much. It's all the Jesus experience, which is a wonderful experience. It is what gets us, and, but there is more, and that's what the writer of Hebrews keeps saying. When we get to Hebrews 6 and 10, you're going to be shocked by what he says. And so this, these are great pictures that, yes, we are blessed. We are uh, children of God who have the power to become sons and daughters. By and through faith. Faith. Don't lose that little point. Thank you very much. Anything else? And how is faith obtained, scholars? Faith comes by hearing, hearing what? The word. That's right. That's why that when churches don't teach the word, they are not helping their congregates increase in faith to keep walking in that, in that mode. Okay, hence you can see the, the call to 
teach the word of God. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we uh, lift all of ourselves up here, myself and everybody who's sitting here uh, together, that you will help us. You know that our flesh is certainly weak. Uh, you are strong. Greater is he that is in us than uh, he that is in the world, Lord. And we don't want to be in the world. We want to be of you, our Father on high. So we pray that you will help us to remember these pictures and types and illustrations and models and messages from uh, the Old Testament. And these are so important to our understanding what the Christian walk looks like. We pray that you will help us to never become sus, uh, uh, become, uh, uh, I can't think of the word, Lord, susceptible. That we won't be susceptible to Satan's tricks, that we now have to become perfected in the flesh by our works and our means and our giving and our devotion to going to church and dressing and doing, but it is by the heart of our faith, God, that you pray that you will increase our faith and you will help us to turn to your word so that we can grow in this substance that you call it, this substance, and it will be rich in us as we move forward as children here, Lord, and then sons and daughters. We pray for Paul, our brother, who has struggled and is getting better. We pray for his emotional and physical well-being, for Barry, for healing. He's in ICU. For Carla and uh, for her healing. Lord, she has uh, undergone two knee operations, and we lift her up right now uh, because she's got addicted to the painkillers, which is so easy to do. And uh, it's been a horrible uh, time for her to adjust to get off those things. So we pray that she will get the proper help, proper guidance, and that you will come in and heal her and uh, get her back to her normal self. Uh, Diane, that for her health, uh, and for Marty Erickson, back surgery, Alan Erickson, who's caring for Marty, and that their eyes open to the true Christ. In this mortal by, Lord, in this physical world, we suffer, and more and more uh, because we are not of this world. So we pray that you will step in as you did when you walk the earth, Heal us, protect us, guide us, provide for us, and let us look to you as the author and finisher of our faith. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty.
judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord.